for this afternoon session, we have uh, four talks. The first one opening the, the first uh, half of the afternoon sessions is uh, Nomi Jacquet, who is uh, here with us. Uh, she is currently a postdoctoral researcher in KIT uh, in the lab of uh, Tamina Sfur. And she's uh, going to talk a lot about uh, optimization on reminding manifolds. So, this is yours. Thank you. Okay, um, so welcome back, everybody. So, in this session, I'm going to talk to you about optimization on Riemannian manifolds. Um, so, if that works, yeah, great. So, first of all, what am I talking about when I saying Riemannian opt um, yeah, optimization on Riemannian manifolds or Riemannian optimization and why it's useful? So, the idea here is that actually you will have a function that is defined as a function of variable on a manifold. So, typically, you have the sphere, you have points on the sphere. And those points of the sphere are passing through a function, which gives you a scalar value, right? And in some cases, you would like to optimize this function so that to find the minimum value of the function on the sphere. So here, the minimum value is here, uh, given by the star. Um, the idea here is that you don't want, I mean, you could use Euclidean methods, but if you do that, you have to constrain your optimization on the sphere. And actually, if we use here Riemannian method, we take into account the intrinsic geometry of our manifold into account. So in general, we actually get faster convergence and better solutions. So we have a better optimization of our variable. Um, so today I'm going to go talk about uh, three topics. So the first one is first order optimization algorithm. So optimization algorithm that take into account only the gradient of our function. Then second order, where we take also the Hessian information, so the second order information into account. And finally, I will go briefly through some black box optimization algorithm, um, namely here Bayesian optimization on Riemann and Manifold. So starting with uh, the first order optimization algorithm. So as I told you, those first order optimization are based on the gradient of your function. So the first thing that we need to generalize when we want to optimize on Riemann and manifold is actually to generalize this notion of gradient. So what is a gradient of a function on the Riemann manifold? So I will just remind you quickly what is a gradient on Euclidean space so that everybody's on the same page and we can move on. Um, so in Euclidean space, you have a function that goes from RD, so a higher a high dimensional Euclidean space and it goes, um, it gives you a scalar. So for example, here we have a function in R2, so two dimensional space. And at each point in this space, you have uh, the function that gives you a value, okay? So the gradient is simply given as the vector of partial derivative of your function. And it gives you the, the direction of greatest increase of the function. So in our case, the greatest increase from this point X is actually um, the one that goes up where the function is changing uh, the faster. Um, Another important notion is the notion of directional derivative that I'm gonna use just after to generalize this notion of gradient. So the directional derivative is giving you the rate of change of the function when you start at X and you move in a direction V. So you can see the direction as a velocity. So here I'm, I'm moving in that direction and uh, the scalar uh, directional derivative gives me the rate of change of this function in this direction. There is an important link between directional derivative and gradient is that you can always obtain the directional derivative by computing the inner product between your direction or your velocity and your gradient. Okay, this is actually crucial uh, to generalize gradients to remain in manifolds. So now moving to the manifold setting, we have in this case a function that is defined with input on the manifold. So here we have, for example, a sphere and the function gives us a scalar value. In that case, the notion of directional derivative is actually the same as in Euclidean space. It gives us the rate of change of the function when we move through a point X at a velocity V. The difference here is that the velocity V lies on the tangent space of the point at X, right? So this is important. Your velocity is always attached to your point and the directional derivative is defined in this direction on the tangent space. Now the gradient, um, it has the same meaning as in Euclidean space. It means that it gives us the greatest increase of the function. As you see for the directional derivative and for directions, the gradient is actually a kind of velocity. So it's defined on the tangent space at the point X. Okay, so my, my gradient is gonna be defined again in this tangent space. And here we don't have a 
so simple closed form solution as in Euclidean space, but we have to use this relationship between directional derivative and the gradient, as I showed you previously. And we have to use this relationship on women and manifold, which means that this inner product here is defined based on X, so it's the inner product that is defined based on the Riemannian metric, the one that we talked about this morning. So the nearer recipe to find the gradient on a Riemannian manifold is compute this directional derivative. You can do that. It's actually the integral here. It's not complicated. And you try to arrange it back in a form that gives you your inner product. And from this form, you, you extract the gradient. Okay, You identify your gradient with that. Um, so now we always have a Riemannian metric. So this Riemannian metric is actually nice because it allows us to have a simpler solution for the gradient based on this relationship. So in general, your Riemannian gradient is equal to the inverse of your Riemannian metric times your Euclidean gradient. So this is a relationship you can always use. Um, I'm putting here this Euclidean gradient with that F with this small bar. Actually, it's just to say that um, I, I told you the function is defined on the Riemannian manifold. So to compute the Euclidean gradient, you actually have to have a smooth um, so here you define a smooth version of your function so that the function is equal to your original function on the manifold and just varies smoothly out of the manifold. Okay, just to allow you to compute this Euclidean gradient. In practice, usually you can just use the same function and, and it computes, it's fine. Um, so just to prove you that this relationship actually satisfies uh, the relationship with the directional derivative that I told you about before. I think it doesn't want to work. Can you move the slide, please? No. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry for that. Um, okay, so just to prove that this actually satisfies the relationship that I told you about before. So I take here my inner product between a direction and my uh, Riemannian gradient product defined on the Riemannian manifolds. You can expand this. So here I told you that my gradient is equal to this Riemannian metric inverse times the Euclidean gradient. I just plug it here. Developing this inner product, you just put the Riemannian metric here in the center, the transpose here, and this is uh, your second part of the product. Those two cancel out. So here you just have the inner product between the direction and the Euclidean gradient. And this is equal to the Euclidean uh, directional derivative, which itself corresponds to the directional derivative on the manifold. So this relationship holds. There is one case uh, where we have an even simpler job in computing the gradient is the case of Riemannian submanifolds. So Riemannian submanifolds are, uh, so Hans Peter briefly talked about that in the case of the sphere is actually Riemannian manifold that are embedded in another Riemannian manifold and that inherit this metric of this manifold. So we have the example of the sphere. So SD or here S2, it's embedded in the Euclidean space of one more dimension. So here I have S2 embedded in R3 and it inherits the metric of the Euclidean space. So the case of the sphere is one of those cases where you can compute the gradient in an, in an easier way. So in that case, you can simply compute the Riemannian gradient as the orthogonal projection on the tangent space of the Euclidean gradient. So that means that you have your Euclidean gradient here. You just project it orthogonally on the tangent space at X, and this gives you your, your Riemannian gradient. So in principle, this is actually very easy to do. Uh, in the case of the sphere, it means that your Riemann gradient is just this projection times the, the um, Euclidean gradient. And you see that this is a very simple form, actually. OK, so now we have the notion of gradients. So it means that we can, in principle, generalize Riemann and gradient, de um, gradient descent to Riemann and manifold. So in the case of um, gradient descent, just to remind you in Euclidean space how it goes. So this is really the most vanilla gradient descent that you can get, OK, that I'm showing here. I'm going to generalize that a bit later. So you want to minimize a function f, and you want to find the x minimizing this. You start at a given point uh, x0, and then you just iterate in that way, where um, your next uh, iterate is equal to your current iterate minus a step, a step size times your gradient. So you're really going down in the steepest de descent from uh, in your function. In the Riemannian case, you want to minimize a function uh, as a function of the variable on the manifold. You again start at a given point on your manifold. 
And then this is the update rule that you have. So your net iterate is equal to the exponential map at the current point of um, your gradient multiplied by a step size. So here, the main difference, I guess you see it, is this exponential map. Because your gradient is on your tangent space, so when you want to update the value uh, x, what you have to do is use the exponential map to actually uh, shoot this geodesic and, and obtain this new point uh, on the manifold, right? So you're projecting from the tangent space onto the manifold for your next iterate. And this, thanks to the properties of the exponential map, it guarantees that you are always on the manifold. You're never gonna go out of it, okay? So you, you really do your gradient descent without going out of this manifold. Um, so my plan here was to show you some code. I will try to do that <coughs> if it works more or less because of the setup, then I will just, um, yeah, go to the next step. So I will try that. Okay, so that seems to be fine. Um, so what I'm doing here is that I, I'm just gonna show you a very simple implementation of what I just wrote uh, in the slides um, on a Colab notebook. So what you can see here is that I defined first uh, a class that is Fear. And in this class Fear, uh, this is very inspired on PyManopt setup for those that are using PyManopt in case. Um, the important thing on this class Fear is that I'm defining an exponential map. So this is the exponential map on the sphere and I'm defining the gradient. So you can recognize the shape of this gradient is actually what I really just showed you, where you have this projection operator here times the Euclidean gradient of the function. Can you increase the size? Um, probably, yes. Um, better? Okay. Okay, so this is the exponential map. This is the gradient. Um, okay, then I'm just defining a very simple function that I want to optimize. So here is a quadratic function um, of X. We have a parameter A, a parameter B, and a parameter C. Uh, this is just a quadratic form, uh, but with vectors, right? The gradient of this is actually very easy to compute. It's just AX plus B. And this is just what I'm implementing here. So I have, uh, I define A, B, and C. Uh, I define my function, which is exactly what is written up, and I define my gradient. Um, here I'm just plotting, I will just show you how the function is looking like. So it's uh, on this sphere. And basically the whiter, the smaller is the value. So at the end, when you optimize, you would like just to find the optimal value, which is around here. So now implementing this Riemannian gradient descent. So this is the update step that I just showed you before. Um, so what we do here is simply, we have this Riemannian gradient descent uh, function. So we first compute the Riemannian gradient based on that manifold class, which I'm gonna just uh, pass as the sphere that I defined previously. And you see that here we use the Euclidean gradient in function of X, as a function of X. I'm just computing the norm of the gradient to see when I converge. So this is not uh, very crucial. And this is then the update step. So I'm using the exponential map at the previous X uh, of minus the step size time my gradient. And then here I'm just uh, printing the results, checking some convergence. Um, if I converge, I go out and that's it. Okay, um, so here is actually when I'm doing uh, this Riemann gradient descent on the sphere of dimension two. So this is that sphere S2 that we saw previously in the plot. And um, this is how, like, how the algorithm converge. So you see we start um, that's the value of the function, that the norm of the gradient, and you see that we are decreasing in function um, when we, the iterations are advancing. So we are decreasing, decreasing until finally after um, some few iteration we converge. So you see that the norm of the gradient is already very small. I kind of put it very tiny to converge. So this is why we still do steps here. And then I'm just plotting, so the, the iteration of my function. So actually I started with the x0 zero here, and this is the points that I visited during the optimization until finding the optimum, which is here where we expected it. Okay, so you see that this is actually very simple to implement. 
Any question on the code? I will close it and go back to the slides otherwise. Fine, okay. So let me try now to close that and to go back to the slides. Okay, great. So that was really like the, the most simple algorithm that you can have in terms of Riemannian optimization. So now we can move to something. Um, okay, this is what I just showed you actually with another plot. Um, yeah, I, I think we can just skip that. It's just to show you, okay, this is our iterate, the gradient on the attention space, the gradient uh, weighted by the step size, the exponential map, we move from the attention space to the manifold and then we continue. Um, so then we can go actually to any kind of first order gradient descent algorithm and it's the same principle. So if you take a very general view of a Euclidean first order gradient algorithm, um, what you do first is that you update the search direction. So you have a search direction which is telling you in which direction you're going to try to find your next iterate. This search direction is updated as a function of your current gradient and of your previous search direction. So usually we combine both in some way. Then you update your estimate. So simply your uh, next estimate is your current one plus some alpha times your step size. And that's it. You do that, you iterate, and at the end, you find your optimum. You can do exactly the same on remaining manifolds, uh, where in this case, you also first update the search direction. Just pay attention that all those elements are actually in the tangent space of your current iterate. Um, so your search direction is a function of your remaining gradient and of the previous search direction. I will come back in a minute in why here I'm writing them with a different letter. Then you update your estimate. So your estimate is obtained, your new uh, estimate is obtained by the exponential map at your current one uh, of your search direction that is on the, on the tangent space of your manifold. And then this is actually the crucial operation at the end that you cannot forget, otherwise you mess up your algorithm completely. So you have to parallel transport your search direction into the tangent space of your new estimate. So I showed you this uh, parallel transport operation this morning. So it means that you have your previous search direction, which is in the tangent space of your previous estimate, and you need to move it to the tangent space of your new estimate so that here above, you can actually compare it with your current gradient um, and do this operation here in the tangent space. Right? So you need to put everything in the ten same tension space and you do this via this parallel transport operation. Okay, so just a couple of examples here. Um, I will show you the Riemannian conjugate gradient descent uh, just to illustrate how that works. So here we start at a point X, we have a search direction eta in the tangent space. First, we find the next iterate. So in this case, for the conjugate gradient descent, we first solve a line search problem in order to find our step size. Um, once we have our step size, our next iterate is exactly the update rule that we had on the previous slide. And then you want to find the next search direction. So what we do first is what I told you, we are parallel transporting our search direction from the previous tangent space onto the current tension space. So this is our uh, parallel transported search direction. Then we compute our gradient. And then we have an update rule of the search direction, which is combining our gradient and the previous search direction. And then we iterate those points until convergence. Okay. Um, another example is the AMS grad algorithm. So here I'm, I'm just putting you the algorithm in Euclidean space. So here we initialize the first order and the second order momentum. Uh, then we iterate, we compute the, the Euclidean gradient. We update the first momentum in function of the previous one and of the gradient, then the second one in function of the previous one and of the gradient as well. And at the end, we have uh, this update rule um, here. So in the Riemannian case, so you can also generalize all those stochastic algorithms, so Adam, AMS, Grad, all of these, you also have the generalization, so you can use it in neural network and everywhere you want. Um, so the generalization here, there are several points. So the first one we use here, the Riemannian gradient instead of the Euclidean one. Second, in the update rule, we use the exponential map. And third, we are parallel transporting the momentum into uh, the tangent space of the current estimate. So it's exactly the same principle in the same steps.
Okay, so I'm going to switch now to the second order optimization algorithm. If you have any question of the first order, maybe we can take that now before I move on to the to the next topic. Yes. Can can you come to the mic? Sorry. <laughs> I miss something because normally if you have a function, you could use the differential, right? And then you, you could use, a, you have a covector, you could use the metric and, and define the gradient. I don't understand why you need the direction to parallel transport the direction. Why do you need it? So if you have your previous direction, which is your, your previous gradient, um, and you want to combine your current gradient and your previous search direction. So there are several algorithms that are doing that in order to- But, but why faster. would you do that? If you, if you have a function, that's what I don't understand. If you have a function mm -hmm. on the manifold, you can calculate the differentials, the, the D of the F, which yeah. is a covector. Mm -hmm. And then you just multiply by the metric. You have the direction, you just follow that direction. So mm -hmm. you don't need the previous one. I don't understand that. And then use the exponential, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the previous one, they use it in some algorithm to have like for optimizing stochastic functions, for example. So it's something that they just do in Euclidean space. So I'm just here transporting it to manifold. Okay. Um, yeah, it okay. has better convergence properties in, for some functions, typically stochastic neural network, they use that a lot. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other question here? Okay, then I move on. Um, I will cover the second order optimization algorithm a bit quick um, to have a bit of time then to cover the black box ones. So um, second order, so now we have the notion of gradient and manifold. We want to have now this notion of Hessian on Riemann and manifold as well. So again, going to Euclidean space, you know that the Euclidean Hessian is just the matrix of the second partial derivative of the function. This is a symmetric matrix. And uh, again, we need to view it in a from a slightly different point of view in order to generalize to, to remain and manifold. So the Hessian can be viewed as a linear operator in which basically the directional derivative of your gradient in a direction V is equal in the Euclidean case to your Hessian matrix multiplied by uh, this vector or this direction V, right? And this is actually viewed in a general term as a linear operator. Okay, so this relationship is now important for us. So in the Riemannian case, um, we actually want to use this relationship in order to generalize the Hessian in a, as a linear operator. So here is a, the directional derivative of the gradient. So we need a notion of directional derivative of gradients of, of vector fields on Riemannian manifolds. So this notion is called the Levi-Civita connection. Um, I don't want to go into details here because that can just take an hour just to explain that concept. So what I just want to tell you is that, again, if you have your Riemannian metric, you can compute this connection. So you just need to know your Riemannian metric as usual, and you have actually this relationship that holds. Um, the point here is that in general, in Riemannian case, we just have the value of the linear operator. So you won't have only the Hessian matrix. You will always have the Hessian matrix multiplied by uh, this vector. So you just have your linear operator. Um, then again, in the case of Riemannian to manifold, we have some simpler expressions. We can again simply use that the levi connection here is equal to the projection of the uh, Euclidean directional derivative. <laughs> So it means that uh, the, the linear operator of our Hessian is actually equal to the projection of um, the directional derivative of our gradient, which this is just our Hessian matrix times the direction V in Euclidean space. So you just project that again um, perpendicularly to the uh, tangent space. Uh, so for the sphere, again, we simply use the same projection operator as what I showed you before. Um, Okay, I will go quickly now through an example of optimization algorithm, which is the Newton method. So it's the simplest one, again, that you can use. So just to remind you, in Euclidean space, you start at a value x0, and then you have that kind of iterate where uh, the value v is obtained by minimizing a quadratic, a quadratic approximation of your function. So it's um, here in the case where your function is, um, your x, sorry, is a scalar. So you see we use the first order derivative, the second order derivative. And when we minimize um, this approximation, we obtain that V is equal of minus the gradient divided by the, the second order derivative. Then if you have, have uh, X that is multivariate, you write down the same thing. 
except that just here we use the gradient, the Hessian, and the notion of inner product instead of here simply the scalar multiplication. And at the end of the day, this is the update rule that you're obtaining, right? Um, in the remaining multifold case is actually very similar. Again, we have the update rule that is changing. We use the exponential map, right? Because this vector V is gonna be on the tangent space. Um, it is also obtained by minimizing a quadratic approximation. In this case, our quadratic approximation takes into account the inner product on the manifold. So we use again, Riemannian metrics and manifold tools. Uh, and here we write the Hessian as a linear operator. And uh, in that case, we solve uh, this equation, which usually doesn't have closed form solutions. So we usually solve it actually with conjugate gradient descent um, to get the value of V that you then update uh, in, your, in your iterate rule here. Okay, so let me talk to you for the, how much time I have left, 15 minutes, um, about black box optimization algorithm on women and manifold. So here I'm just gonna focus on a single algorithm, which is Bayesian optimization. Um, it's simply because it's an algorithm that actually works well for robotics. So as you know, in robotics, we often have to optimize some variables. So here I have an example where I'm doing a peg in a hole and I want to optimize the orientation in order to insert this peg in the hole. And here uh, to optimize the stiffness matrix of the robot again for this insertion task. So then if we change the environment, for example, here, we actually need to adapt uh, the angles to the orientation of the, of the hole. And here we may need to adapt the stiffness uh, during the insertion, actually, in order to insert the, the, hole efficient, uh, the peg efficiently. So in robotics, we know that controllers and policy parameters often have to be adapted or refined. And um, as we aim usually for a safe, a fast, and a data efficient learning process, Bayesian optimization is actually well suited. It satisfies uh, those three criteria. So one way to improve the, the data efficiency of Bayesian optimization is to, um, to, in, uh, uh, to introduce inductive bias into the algorithm. So these are some works that um, improve the data efficiency of BO by introducing inductive bias in different manners. And in our case, I guess you can imagine, I want to introduce uh, inductive bias via the knowledge that we have about the geometry of the search space. So let me just recap also what Bayesian optimization is in Euclidean space, and then I will show you how it generalizes to the Riemannian manifold case. So in Euclidean space, we want again to optimize a function f. The difference compared to what I showed you before is that in this case, the function f, we don't know he, um, we don't know really a, a closed form explicit solution of it. So we can query the function at any point in our space and get the value of f, but we don't know easily the gradient or the Hessian for what matters. Um, so it means that here, okay, I, I plotted the ground truth, but in general, you don't have this ground truth, but then you can query observations, so some x and get the value of your function at those observations. So it's really a black box function. So what Bayesian optimization does is first, we actually model our objective function using usually a Gaussian process. You can use other things, but Gaussian process is usually what is used in most of the case. Um, so a Gaussian process is just given a Gaussian prior. And then by uh, computing the posterior, we have an estimate of our function. So the estimate here is the mean of the Gaussian process that you see it goes through the observation. And it also gives us a notion of uncertainty. Okay, so this envelope is the uncertainty that we have about the value of our model. So when you are far from observation, like here, you have a high uncertainty because you're not sure if your model is correct or not. Um, then the second step of Bayesian optimization is that we defined what is called an acquisition function, which is gonna trade off between exploration and exploitation. So exploitation is exploiting the value, for example, here, where your model is telling you that your function has a low value. So you may go there to actually get a better optima. And the exploration is exploring where you don't have much information about your function, so regions of high uncertainty. So you can define this acquisition function, and then we optimize this acquisition function. Um, and the maximum that we find is actually the next point that we are gonna query, okay? So then we're gonna query the point here, find the observation, we iterate this process, and usually after 10, 20 iteration, we actually have, a, like first we find our global minimum, and second, we have a good estimate of our function. So to uh, generalize Bayesian optimization to Riemannian manifolds, you have to pay attention to two main points. 
The first one is that your Gaussian process is entirely specified by its mean and its covariance matrix or kernel matrix. And in general, in Euclidean space, those kernel matrix, so here you have the classical squared exponential kernels, it depends on the Euclidean distance. So as I think you're starting to understand um, on Riemannian manifolds, you cannot use Euclidean distance because for example, here you're just going through the earth and you would like to stay on the surface. So what we propose here is actually to define new notions of kernel that exploits a notion of Riemannian distance. So I'm not gonna go into detail here because Leonel is gonna cover Gaussian processes on Riemannian manifold in the learning part, at least a bit of this. So I'm gonna focus here in the second point which is that the quality of the next query point is depending on how well we are optimizing our acquisition function. Um, so we always have that option of doing some constraint optimization and forcing our points to be on the manifold. But again, what we can do here is what I showed you before is that we can replace this optimization by a Riemannian optimization, which is an unconstrained problem with better convergence and solution properties. So in this case, uh, we don't actually change the formulation of the acquisition function. The only thing that we change is how we search. So the search space of it. So in this case, the search space is becoming the Riemannian manifold and we use Riemannian optimization techniques. So here you can use more or less the one that you want in terms of first order, second order algorithm. You just have to choose one that actually fits um, as best as you can your, your, the optimization of your, your um, acquisition function. So in practice, we often used the conjugate gradient and uh, the trust region on Riemann and Manifold. Those two are actually working fine for us. Um, and then this is the final uh, Bayesian optimization algorithm. So as previously, you just have a set of observed data and then you have a um, budget of trials. So N of them, you first update the, the hyperparameters of your Riemannian Gaussian process model. Then you select the next query point by solving this optimization of the acquisition function on Manifold you query your objective function and you up, uh, update your data set. And at the end of your N iteration, you take the best one. Um, so just to give you an, an intuition of what it gives. So here I'm gonna show you how we can optimize the Ackley function on the sphere. So this is the optima, this is the function. Um, these are the 2D projections. So you see here we have the axis X1, X2, here X1, X2, and this is the value of the function. And here X2 and X3, and we recover X2 and X3 and the value of the function. So the minima here is uh, the star here. So this is the ground truth. This is really the value of the function. Um, this is what we aim at finding. And then I will show you the evolution of the Gaussian process mean on the sphere. So this is the Gaussian process at the very beginning of the algorithm where we have only uh, here a couple of observations. Um, and then I will show you the evolution of the GP mean here on the projection and of the variance. So the variance is this gray envelope that you can see here. Again, I'm aiming at finding this optimum. And I will show you also the evolution of the current best, so the best value of the function that we observed so far. Okay, so here you see the Bayesian optimization is querying. We first have a phase of exploitation. So you see that we went quite fast, close to the optimum. And now the Bayesian optimization is actually um, exploring. So checking the, the locations where we have a high uncertainty. And you see that we are refining our model. And at the end of the day, we're gonna have like a model of the function that is very close to the function itself. So I will show you a second time. We have now uh, exploitation. We find something very close to the optimum. And then we have this exploration phase. And you see here that all the queries are directly on the sphere. We never query anything out of it. This is really the, the important property. Um, just to show you that actually it's efficient and I'm not just lying to you. Um, so here is some convergence statistics uh, for 30 trials. Uh, the important points uh, that you have to look at is here so the, the convergence in function of the number of evaluation, and this is the final convergence over 30 trials. Um, so this one is a Riemannian algorithm with the squared exponential kernel. This one is the Euclidean algorithm with the same type of kernel. This one is the Riemannian Matern kernel and the Euclidean one with the same type of kernel. So you see that here we are clearly outperforming. Um, we have just other cases, other functions, other manifolds. And what is important to observe here is that even if in some cases, the Riemannian optimization doesn't do much better than the Euclidean optimization, it actually never does worse. So it's actually always worth putting the Riemannian optimization because in the worst case, you don't gain anything. And in the best case, you actually gain a lot. So you can see, for example, this one, those two are the Riemannian ones, those two are the Euclidean one, and the difference can be huge. 
So in general, um, if you have this Riemannian Bayesian optimization, you have faster convergence, better accuracy, and also lower solution variance. So it depends less on where you start. Um, and just to show you a robotic example, so this is a very simple example um, where we have a velocity controller. So we have a robot, we want the robot to go from here to there, and we would like that robot to be able to do that fast and efficiently. So the cost function that we give is that the robot has to minimize the jerk. It has to, um, we are looking here for the for desired manipulability to track. So we want that desired manipulability to be aligned with the direction of motion so that the robot has a higher capacity to go um, in the direction of motion. And finally, this Riemannian, um, sorry, this manipulability ellipsoid, we would like the robot to be able to track it. So we measure the difference between the desired manipulability that we're optimizing for and the one that the robot is actually tracking. Um, so I will show you here several iterations. So here you have some bio um, iterations. The desired one, the one that we're optimizing is the, is the um, green one. And the one that the robot is actually tracking is the purple one. So you see that at the beginning, uh, it actually doesn't manage to track well. So we have a high uh, cost function here. And you will see that after several iterations, it actually finds a manipulability that goes in the right direction and that the robot is able to track. So you see here that the, the value of the function is actually decreasing. And here we are starting to have something that you see the two ellipsoids are um, overlapping, so we are able to track it, and the ellipsoid is elongated along uh, this axis. So then you have more iteration, and after uh, 100 iteration, this is the best one that you obtain. So you see we are aligned properly, and the robot is able to track this manipulability. Again, to show you just convergence properties, so this is the convergence statistics. Um, again, our Riemannian one is um, the orange one that you can see here, and it outperforms uh, the Euclidean ones that are there. Um, so with that, I just want to give you a couple of references that you can look at for Riemannian optimization. Um, the first one is this book of Pierre-Antoine Abzil and colleagues um, on optimization algorithm on matrix manifold. This is actually a very nice book. And a second one that is also very nice, um, that is already available online, but will be officially published next year from Nicolas Boumal um, on optimization on smooth manifold. I think that everybody took the picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're ready. <laughs> and, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. So libraries for Riemannian optimization, which is also very important. Um, the one that I'm really recommending if you're going for a classical optimization is PyManopt, um, uh, Manopt, sorry, which is available in MATLAB, in Python, which is the PyManopt version, and, and in Julia. So you have implementation of all those algorithms for a full bunch of manifolds. Um, it works really nicely. We are using it now since quite a while. And the second one uh, is Geopt. So this is for stochastic optimization. So if you want to go for neural network optimization on manifolds, all that kind of things, um, here you have the Riemannian Adam, the stochastic gradient descent, uh, and I think a couple of others. Okay, this is actually my last slide. The last one is uh, thank you for your attention. So I leave you finish with the pictures and I stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Naomi, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. And I was curious about this bio stuff because you are explaining like uh, working with the kernels of the distance. But my question is like, if you have a matrix that is changing, depends on positions, then probably this kernel is not symmetric anymore, right? Uh, in, in which sense you have a matrix uh, you, that's you, changing? You, 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 I, I was just wondering in general case, like, because you can define some geometry, uh, remaining matrix, but in general, the matrix can be changing in different po <laughs> points, right? Mm -hmm. And then in this case, I guess this kind of metric would be different. And when you are applying the kernels, probably the, the kernel will be different if you are from one point to another and from the, this point to back to the, the original one. Okay. So in principle, your Riemannian metric is symmetric. So then your distance function is symmetric as well. And as the kernel is kind of built on this notion of distance, then your kernel is also symmetric. Yeah, but uh, the point is like uh, you cannot switch or like uh, the distance from A to B is 
different than the distance from B to A in my understanding. Like if you have a metric differently at A and B. No, so the, the distance from A to B is the same as the distance from B to A. Um, your metric is varying smoothly, but you know that the distance you obtain it by integrating the length of the curve from A to B, and from A to B or B to A, you always have the same curve. So when you integrate the length, you obtain the distance and the distance doesn't change. So you ah, have okay. symmetry property. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, um, could you comment a little bit on computation time comparisons between the Euclidean case and the Riemannian case? Because I guess if the um, parallel transport map and in the exponential map are complicated to compute, then it could take longer. So it is true that the computational cost of a single iteration in principle can be a bit higher for Riemannian manifolds. And not even not for all. If you take the sphere, actually, is extremely fast uh, because the operations are very simple. So yeah, in principle, you may take a bit longer for a single iteration, but you're going to converge faster and better. So you need less iteration, and at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you recover that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Naomi. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was really nice. Um, I, I had a question about the benchmarking against Euclidean. Um, methods in the Bayesian optimization. So are you also enforcing constraints there in some way for the Euclidean? And if so, how? Um, so for the kernel, we just use the classical squared exponential kernel. So this one doesn't have constraints. But for the optimization of the acquisition function, then we constrain on the manifold. Yeah. Okay. So we do really classical constraint optimization. Okay. Yeah. And if I can ask maybe a zoomed out question. So. Um, in, interior point methods kind of turned over linear programming, um, like sort of the ability to actually leave the sort of surface manifold where you know the, the solution lies. Um, how does this compare to even something like quadratic you know, penalty methods or augmented Lagrangians in terms of the ability to maybe leave the manifold? I mean, it seems sometimes beneficial to leave the manifold if you can embed your manifold in an ambient space. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to answer this one. Um, sure, it's a really broad zoomed yeah, out question, yeah. so thank you. Um, so I, I think that the, so the, the main difference here is that when you are optimizing with those uh, augmented Lagrange methods and you're trying to find the solution manifold, you know that your solution manifold is still in Euclidean space. So you are still optimizing in Euclidean space to find something there. You can actually transpose that all the same to Riemannian manifold case where you, for example, have a sphere and you want to find your solution manifold that is a subspace of that sphere. And in that case, actually, it exists augmented Lagrangian methods on Riemannian manifold. Um, so it really depends how your, your general ambient space is defined, actually, even if you want to find a subset of it in order to have your solution. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>